Clara Barton Clarissa Clara Harlow Barton was a pioneering nurse who founded the American Red Cross. She was a hospital nurse in the American Civil War, a teacher, and patent clerk. Nursing education was not very formalized at that time and she did not attend nursing school, so she provided self taught nursing care. Barton is noteworthy for doing humanitarian work at a time when relatively few women worked outside Ethi home. She was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame in 1973. Clara Barton was born on December 25, 1821, in North Oxford, Massachusetts. Her father was Captain Stephen Barton, a member of the local militia and a selectman who inspired his daughter with patriotism and a broad humanitarian interest. He was a soldier under the command of General Anthony Wayne in his crusade against the Indians in the Northwest. He was also the leader of progressive thought in the Oxford Village area. Barton's mother was Sarah Stone Barton. When she was three years old, Barton was sent to school with her brother Stephen, where she excelled in reading and spelling. Dot at school, she became close friends with Nancy Fitz, she is the only known friend Barton had as a child due to her extreme timidity. When Barton was ten years old, she assigned herself the task of nursing her brother David back to health after he fell from the roof of a barn and received a severe injury. She learned how to distribute the prescribed medication to her brother as well as how to place leeches on his body to bleed him. She continued to care for David long after doctors had given up. He made a full recovery. Her parents tried to help cure her timidity by enrolling her to Colonel Stone's high school, but their strategy turned out to be a catastrophe. Barton became more timid and depressed and would not eat. She was brought back home to regain her health. Upon her return, her family relocated to help a family member. A paternal cousin of Clara's had died and left his wife with four children and a farm. The house that the Barton family was to live in needed to be painted and repaired. Barton was persistent in offering assistance, much to the gratitude of her family. After the work was done, Barton was at a loss because she had nothing else to help with, to not feel like a burden to her family. She began to play with her male cousins and, to their surprise, she was good at keeping up with such activities as horseback riding. It was not until after she had injured herself that Barton's mother began to question her playing with the boys. Barton's mother decided she should focus on more feminine skills. She invited one of Clara's female cousins over to help develop her femininity. From her cousin, she gained proper social skills as well. To assist Barton with overcoming her shyness, her parents persuaded her to become a school teacher. She achieved her first teacher's certificate in 1839, at only 17 years old. This profession interested Barton greatly and helped motivate her. She ended up conducting an effective redistricting campaign that allowed children of workers to receive an education. Successful projects such as this gave Barton the confidence needed when she demanded equal pay for teaching. Barton became an educator in 1838 for 12 years in schools in Canada and West Georgia. Barton fared well as a teacher and knew how to handle rambunctious children, particularly the boys, since as a child she enjoyed her male cousins and brothers' company. She learned how to act like them, making it easier for her to relate to and control the boys in her classroom since they respected her. After her mother's death in 1851, the family home closed down. Barton decided to further her education by pursuing writing and languages at the Clinton Liberal Institute in New York. In this college town, she developed many friendships that broadened her point of view on many issues concurring at the time. The principal of the institute recognized her tremendous abilities and admired her work. This friendship lasted for many years, eventually turning into a romance. As a writer, her terminology was pristine and easy to understand. Her writings and bodies of work could instruct the local statesmen. No one could exceed her outstanding service to humanity in war and in peace. While teaching in Hydestown, Barton learned about the lack of public schools in Bordentown, the neighboring city. In 1852, she was contracted to open a free school in Bordentown, which was the first ever free school in New Jersey. She was successful, and after a year she had hired another woman to help teach over 600 people. Both women were making $250 a year. This accomplishment compelled the town to raise nearly $4,000 for a new school building. Once completed, though, Barton was replaced as principal by a man elected by the school board. They saw the position as head of a large institution to be unfitting for a woman. She was demoted to female assistant and worked in a harsh environment until she had a nervous breakdown along with other health ailments, and quit. In 1855, she moved to Washington, D.C. and began work as a clerk in the U.S. Patent Office, 
This was the first time a woman had received a substantial clerkship in the federal government and at a salary equal to a man's salary. For three years, she received much abuse and slander from male clerks. Subsequently, under political opposition to women working in government offices, her position was reduced to that of copyist, and in 1856, under the administration of James Buchanan, she was fired because of her black republicanism. After the election of Abraham Lincoln, having lived with relatives and friends in Massachusetts for three years, she returned to the patent office in the autumn of 1861, now as temporary copyist, in the hope she could make way for more women in government service. On April 19, 1861, the Baltimore riot resulted in the first bloodshed of the American Civil War. Victims within the Massachusetts Regiment were transported to Washington, D.C. after the violence, which happened to be Barden's home at the time. Wanting to serve her country, Barden went to the railroad station when the victims arrived and nursed 40 men. Barden provided crucial, personal assistance to the men in uniform, many of whom were wounded, hungry and without any supplies besides what they carried on their backs. She began helping them by personally taking supplies to the unfinished Capitol building where the young men of the 6th Massachusetts Militia, who had been attacked in Baltimore, Maryland, were housed. Barton quickly recognized them, as she had grown up with some of them, and some she had even taught. Barton, along with several other women, personally provided clothing, food, and supplies for the sick and wounded soldiers. She learned how to store and distribute medical supplies and offered emotional support to the soldiers by keeping their spirits high. She would read books to them, write letters to their families for them, talk to them, and support them. It was on that day that she identified herself with army work and began her efforts towards collecting medical supplies for the Union soldiers. Prior to distributing provisions directly onto the battlefield and gaining further support, Barton used her own living quarters as a storeroom and distributed supplies with the help of a few friends in early 1862. Despite opposition in the War Department and among field surgeons. Ladies' aid societies helped in sending bandages, food, and clothing that would later be distributed during the Civil War. In August 1862, Barton finally gained permission from Quartermaster Daniel Rucker to work on the front lines. She gained support from other people who believe it in her cause. These people became her patrons, her most supportive being Senator Henry Wilson of Massachusetts. After the First Battle of Bull Run, Barden placed an ad in a Massachusetts newspaper for supplies, the response was a profound influx of supplies. She worked to distribute stores, clean field hospitals, apply dressings, and serve food to wounded soldiers in close proximity to several battles, including Cedar Mountain, Second Bull Run, Antietam, and Fredericksburg. Barden helped both Union and Confederate soldiers. Supplies were not always readily available though. At the Battle of Antietam, for example, Barden used corn husks in place of bandages. In 1863 she began a romantic relationship with an officer, Colonel John J. Elwell. In 1864, she was appointed by Union General Benjamin Butler as the lady in charge of the hospitals at the front of the Army of the James. Among her more harrowing experiences was an incident in which a bullet tore through the sleeve of her dress without striking her and killed a man to whom she was tending. She was known as the American Nightingale. She was also known as the Angel of the Battlefield after she came to the aid of the overwhelmed surgeon on duty following the Battle of Cedar Mountain in Northern Virginia in August 1862. She arrived at a field hospital at midnight with a large amount of supplies to help the severely wounded soldiers. This naming came from her frequent timely assistance as she served troops at the battles of Fairfax Station, Chantilly, Harper's Ferry, South Mountain, Antietam, Fredericksburg, Charleston, Petersburg, and Cold Harbor. After the end of the American Civil War, Barden discovered that thousands of letters from distraught relatives to the War Department were going unanswered because the soldiers they were questioning about were buried in unmarked graves. Many of these soldiers were labeled just as missing. Motivated to do more about the situation, Miss Barden contacted President Lincoln in hopes that she would be allowed to respond officially to these unanswered inquiries. She was given permission, and the search for the missing men commenced. After the war, she ran the Office of Missing Soldiers, at 437 and a half 7th Street, Northwest, Washington, D.C. In the Gallery Place neighborhood. The office's purpose was to find or identify soldiers killed or missing in action. Barton and her assistants wrote 41,855 replies to inquiries and helped locate more than 22,000 missing men. Barton spent the summer of 1865 helping find, identify, and properly bury 13,000 individuals who died in Andersonville prison camp, 
a Confederate prisoner of war camp in Georgia. She continued this task over the next four years, burying 20,000 more Union soldiers and marking tear graves. Congress eventually appropriated $15,000 toward her project. Barton achieved widespread recognition by delivering lectures around the country about her war experiences in 1865 to 1868. During this time, she met Susan B. Anthony and began an association with the women's suffrage movement. She also became acquainted with Frederick Douglass and became an activist for civil rights. After her countrywide tour, she was both mentally and physically exhausted, and under doctor's orders to go somewhere, hat would take her far from her current work. She closed the missing soldier's office in 1868 and traveled to Europe. In 1869, during her trip to Geneva, Switzerland, Barton was introduced to the Red Cross and Dr. Appia, who later would invite her to be the representative Fourth American branch of the Red Cross and even help her find financial beneficiaries for the start of the American Red Cross. She was also introduced to Henry Dunant's book A Memory of Solferino which called for the formation of national societies to provide relief voluntarily on a neutral basis. At the beginning of the Franco-Prussian War, in 1870, she assisted the Grand Duchess of Baden in the preparation of military hospitals, and gave the Red Cross Society much aid during the war. At the joint request of the German authorities and the Strasbourg Comité de Secours, she superintended the supplying of work to the poor of Strasbourg in 1871, after the Siege of Paris, and in 1871 had charge of the public distribution of supplies to the destitute people of Paris. At the close of the war, she received honorable decorations of the Golden Cross of Baden and the Prussian Iron Cross. When Barden returned to the United States, she inaugurated a movement to gain recognition for the International Committee of the Red Cross by the United States government. In 1873, she began work on this project. In 1878, she met with President Rutherford B. Hayes, who expressed the opinion of most Americans at that time which was the U.S. would never again face a calamity like the Civil War. Barton finally succeeded during the administration of President Chester Arthur, using the argument that the new American Red Cross could respond to crises other than war such as natural disasters like earthquakes, forest fires, and hurricanes. Barton became president of the American branch of the society which held its first official meeting at her I Street apartment in Washington, D.C., May 21, 1881. The first local society was founded August 22, 1882 in Dansville, Livingston County, New York, where she maintained a country home. The society's role changed with the advent of the Spanish-American War during which it aided refugees and prisoners of the Civil War. Once the Spanish-American War was over the great people of Santiago built a statue in honor of Barden in the town square which still stands there today. Domestically in 1884 she helped in the floods on the Ohio River, provided Texas with food and supplies during the famine of 1887 and took workers to Illinois in 1888 after a tornado in that same year to Florida for the yellow fever epidemic. Within days after the Johnstown flood in 1889, she led her delegation of 50 doctors and nurses in response. In 1897, Responding to the humanitarian crisis in the Ottoman Empire in the aftermath of the Hamidian massacres, Barden sailed to Constantinople and after long negotiations with Abdul Hamid II, opened the first American International Red Cross headquarters in the heart of Turkey. Barden herself traveled along with five other Red Cross expeditions to the Armenian provinces in the spring of 1896, providing relief and humanitarian aid. Barton also worked in hospitals in Cuba in 1898 at the age of 77. Barton's last field operation as president of the American Red Cross was helping victims of the Galveston hurricane in 1900. The operation established an orphanage for children. As criticism arose of her mixing professional and personal resources, Barton was forced to resign as president of the American Red Cross in 1904 at the age of 83 because of her egocentric leadership style fitting poorly into the formal structure of an organizational charity. She had been forced out of office by a new generation of all-male scientific experts who reflected the realistic efficiency of the progressive era rather than heritialistic humanitarianism. In memory of the courageous women of the Civil War, the Red Cross headquarters was founded. During the dedication, not one person said a word. This was done in order to honor the women and their services. After resigning, Barden founded the National First Aid Society. She continued to live in her Glen Echo, Maryland home which also served as the Red Cross headquarters upon her arrival to the house in 1897. Barden published her autobiography in 1907, titled The Story of My Childhood. On April 12, 1912 at the age of 90, 
she died in her home. The cause of death was pneumonia. Although not formally a member of the Universalist Church of America, in a 1905 letter to the widow of Carl Norman Thrasher, she identified herself with her parents' church as a Universalist. While she was not an active member of her parents' church, Barden wrote about how well known her family was in her hometown and how many relationships her father formed with others in their town through their church and religion. In 1975, the Clara Barden National Historic Site, located at 5801 Oxford Road, Glen Echo, Maryland, was established as a unit of the National Park Service at Barden's home, where she spent the last 15 years of her life. As the first National Historic Site dedicated to the accomplishments of a woman, it preserves the early history of the American Red Cross, since the home also served as an early headquarters of the organization. The North Oxford, Massachusetts, house in which she was born is now also a museum. The National Park Service has restored 11 rooms, including the Red Cross offices, the parlors and Barden's bedroom. Visitors to Clara Barden National Historic Site can gain a sense of how Barden lived and worked. Guides lead tourists through the three levels, emphasizing Barden's use of her unusual home. In 2018 the site was indefinitely closed due to repairs. In 1869, Barden closed the missing soldier's office and headed to Europe. The third floor of her old boarding house was boarded up in 1913, and the site forgotten. The site was lost in part because the city realigned its addressing system in the 1870s. The boarding house became 437 and a half 7th Street Northwest. In 1997, General Services Administration Carpenter Richard Lyons was hired to check out the building for its demolition. He found a treasure trove of Barden items in the attic, including signs, clothing, Civil War soldiers' socks, an army tent, Civil War era newspapers, and many documents relating to the Office of Missing Soldiers. This discovery led to the NPS saving the building from demolition. It took years, however, for the site to be restored. The Clara Barton's Missing Soldiers Office Museum, run by the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, opened in 2015. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.